Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's long-range technical forecast video brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. This analysis is being provided for perspective only, and any decision made based upon this presentation is the sole responsibility of the person making the decision. Finally, please remember that all long-range weather forecasting is speculative by nature. First of all, in tomorrow morning's update on Thursday, I will be talking about the uh, effects of this large derecho that went through <clears throat> parts of the central Corn Belt getting into the eastern Corn Belt here. Uh, finally, putting together some of the last few numbers, and I was waiting this afternoon on some of the new satellite data to kind of see what I could tell about what happened in parts of Illinois from space. So I'll give you that update tomorrow. Meanwhile, I would like to show you that over the last 14 days in terms of precipitation accumulation that where that squall line went through right in through here, you can still see quite a bit of red. In other words, <clears throat> even though we got some locally very heavy rainfall out of this, the storm system itself was moving at an average speed of about 55 miles an hour. And as a result, even though the rainfall was heavy, it, it wasn't around long enough to really start to be corrective on some of the, uh, the, the near-term and the longer-term drought issues that we've seen in this part of the Corn Belt. Notice also in the northern Corn Belt, there are some pockets here that are relatively dry, and we do have some severe weather that we're going to be watching out for in the next couple of days in the northern Corn Belt. Also, the lower Mississippi River Valley into the Delta has been quite dry, as has this part of Texas. Now, outside of that, when you look here uh, where things have been extremely wet, this quarter in through here is going to continue to stay wet, especially right in through here. We're also going to be watching what's going to happen here in the mid-Atlantic getting down into the southeast as potentially having some very wet weather in the near term. Sections of Ohio, Pennsylvania that have shown up very dry as of late. We can see that in the soil moisture as well. We're going to be talking about what to expect there and some model differences. So uh, with that as a backdrop, I also want to talk about temperatures to get us going because the first 12 days of the month have really featured a lot of heat over the southwest and much cooler than average weather here tucked away in the midsection of the United States. And any brief warm warm-ups we saw, like for example over the weekend, were just that, they were brief. So this will be critical to understanding the pattern that will be uh, becoming established with a large ridge developing over the desert southwest. And to be honest, that's something that um, I've struggled, I think, with uh, coming up with the timing on the development of that, of that larger ridge over the southwest. And also, what does this mean for heat that we have seen coming up the east coast? It's going to be a combination of understanding the cloud cover and rainfall to determine if we're going to continue to stay warm there. So a couple of graphs I'd like to keep you updated on. This is the graph that shows you the percent of 2,500 GDUs uh, that we've accumulated since the 1st of April. So again, this is just trying to tell us how far along we are in accumulating kind of that magic number of 2,500 GDUs. And primarily, this is for my corn farmers. Uh, so when we look in the Eastern Corn Belt, we do see from Illinois to Ohio, a lot here in the 85 to 95% range. Uh, Michigan, they're sitting between 75 and 80%. Getting back into Iowa, we see a lot of 80 to 90% of the way to 2,500 GDU. And then going from Nebraska up to uh, South Dakota and North Dakota, we, we basically tail off 10% each way. So Nebraska's in the mid 80s, uh, uh, South Dakota's in the mid 70s, and uh, much of North Dakota's in the mid 60s. And this is all percentage. If you see white on this graph, we have already accumulated 2,500 GDUs. The other graphic I'd like to keep you up to date on is the one about the stress degree day. So remember, this is where we look at how we accumulate the heat over 86 degrees Fahrenheit. And according to Ellen Taylor's research, we gotta be above 140 units on dry land corn farming to see some pretty serious impacts and when you see a lot of green on this map that means that that is those are all locations that have stayed below that threshold so this has been a summer where we have seen some high temperatures but they've been uh, not so sustained in parts of the the corn belt where we've seen the sustained high heat at times has of course been in the southern and high plains and then getting over into the desert southwest where it has been exceptionally hot uh, at times so from there, that's where we're going to be watching the most serious heat building. You can see in the Southern Plains heat advisories out, we have excessive heat watches here in parts of the desert southwest getting in the Central Valley of California. And all of the shading you see here, this is all red flag warning. So this is threat of fires move forward. Go east, we've got flooding problems here and also in the mid-Atlantic. We're going to be talking more about that rainfall we're anticipating there in just a few moments. But to get there, I want to talk about this pattern a week from today. So let's focus on the long range here. This is next Wednesday and I want you to see the operational European model, which to be honest, has been doing a good job. The operational has been doing a good job at picking up on this pattern. We see this trough that's sitting here coming off of Asia, 
a ridge building here into the Gulf of, or excuse me, into the Bering Sea off the Aleutian Islands, a trough in the Gulf of Alaska. We've seen a lot of those as of late, and a ridge over the southwest. We then see that once we get out a week from now, there's still a broad trough that's occupying much of the eastern half of the United States. Some ridging that's out over uh, the Atlantic. We're going to talk about that. A very highly amplified ridge that tucks up here just to the east of, of Greenland, and then broad troughing though as you go into parts of Western Europe. Now when I see this pattern, I see a lot, uh, quite a bit of amplitude to it. In other words, there's a lot of north-south movement, but I don't yet fully see a pattern that I would call being blocked up. In other words, while you may be able to pick out in here maybe an omega pattern in the North Atlantic or the North Pacific, uh, uh, what we don't see is we don't see it getting pinched off in a way that it, it, it closes off a high over low. And that's what, what I would really be looking for to, to really slow this pattern down and cause some problems. But here's one thing that, that's been a major part of this pattern. We've now seen this in the 0Z, the 6Z, and the 12Z run that the model keeps putting down cooler conditions here in the 6 to 10 day forecast and keeping a lot of heat in the desert southwest where that ridge is. Question marks are here in the Pacific Northwest because with those troughs coming out of the Gulf of Alaska, do we really bring in sustained heat to the Northwest? It seems as though right now that the ensemble, mambo, excuse me, the ensemble models are maybe just keeping a bit of a too warm of a bias here overall. I think we're going to be closer to average, but certainly the heat is going to be on over the southeast, or excuse me, the southwest, and we can see that from the central part of the United States to the southeast, the models are clearly picking up on that cooler pattern, getting us out to day 10. Now briefly about precipitation over the next week. This has been a battle here, I think, for understanding which model to be choosing. So we can see that from early this morning, the National Weather Service picking up on the stormier pattern in parts of the Northern Plains, uh, getting into parts of Iowa and Minnesota. You then have this break that's going to be from Michigan into Wisconsin, then down from Illinois through Missouri, and down into the south central United States, especially Texas. But then you notice as you go east of there, the question marks, big ones for me, are going to be in the eastern Corn Belt here. And just how much rain do we get along this boundary and then also along this boundary? I'm going to show you them both in just a few moments. Because it looks as though parts of the Carolinas getting up to Virginia through southern PA might really see some very heavy precipitation. South of there, a lot of hit or miss thunderstorms. And I don't think it's going to be completely dry in Texas either. I think we're going to see storms popping on the heat of the day. So to show you that model comparison, here's the GFS. And what you're looking at here is this, the, the noon. So this, excuse me, not the noon, the 12Z run, which comes out about noon. And what you've got here is uh, the next week's worth of precipitation. So do notice that as you get over into parts of the Eastern Corn Belt, we see quite a bit of precipitation. And you saw there's some very, very dry areas over here. Appalachian Mountains, very wet. The Carolinas through Virginia, very wet. And you can also see right in through parts of the Mid-South, uh, quite a bit of wet weather as we're going to see the storms still firing up uh, all along the plains getting up here into parts of Manitoba. Drier in southern Alberta and Saskatchewan, that seems to be a pretty uh, consistent picture being painted by the models. And here again is the European, seeing a very similar thing. So I, I'm okay here. I also think the models are consistent with what's happening in the northern plains, although not not necessarily perfect on the rainfall. But now, now that I flick that back and forth, come back to the Euro, and I'd like your attention over here for just a moment, okay? So this is the European model's uh, forecast for the next seven days. This is the GFS again. So notice the difference in parts of the Eastern Corn Belt in terms of total accumulated precipitation. And that difference is critical, I think, as we press forward here with the European being drier farther to the south. They agree very well, though, on this wetter pattern here, stretching from the southeast up through the mid-Atlantic. We'll talk about why in just a few moments. So taking a look at tropical activity over the next week, we are going to be watching Tropical Depression 11, could be called Tropical Storm Josephine, according to the National Hurricane Center, which is projecting this to strengthen somewhat. The European model is picking up on a path, something like this, very similar to what the GFS is right now saying as well. So we at least have some good model agreement on the overall path of this system. But notice two other things. Coming off of Africa, we're not slowing down the tropical wave activity, and also we're going to be seeing some low pressure developing here off the east coast that uh, could be moving out. Now, this is not tr uh, tropical in nature, but just watching some low pressure develop there as it gets sandwiched in between two larger ridges. Now, to think about those ridges, I want to take you all the way out to day 15 pretty quickly here. So what I see here in the pattern from the GFS versus the European, European being on the right, is that the GFS tends to carry more amplitude. And to be honest with you, when we go back and do some verification, it seems as though the European's 50 
a member ensemble is washing out some important features when we look at it in terms of an average, whereas the 20 member GFS ensemble isn't. So this has been a kind of a familiar feature coming out of the Gulf of Alaska, and the GFS has this trough quite a bit more broad. Both models do agree on putting a ridge over uh, the southwest, which would mean you'd get flow that would come into the eastern part of the United States that would suggest northwest flow, would suggest at the base of the trough cutting through the mid-Atlantic, stormier conditions, but also cooler conditions. But you notice the European model flattens it out. And with that flatter flow overall, it will not, the model will not be producing more precipitation. So let me, let me show you what I mean by that. Temperatures first. See the GFS much more aggressive on bringing in the cooler weather, and it's even trended cooler as you're now looking at the 12Z run in that area. Quite a bit more heat here. I still think the model might be biased a bit too warm in this section of North America as well, here in the Pacific Northwest. What does the GF, or excuse me, the Europeans say? Well, look at how it has the cooler weather here, but not in this area. And that was because, remember, the flow that it was trying to come up with was a bit flatter in through that zone. Therefore, it's pushing the jet stream farther north, whereas the GFS was a bit more aggressive with the ridge and the subsequent downstream trough, which is why it's showing up on the cooler side of things. This is echoed very well in the precipitation forecast, too, for week two. You see here a drier, whereas in the, the, uh, the GFS, it's actually got in there a wetter signature. Once again, it has to do with the magnitude, or the uh, not the magnitude, but the amplitude, excuse me, of that trough ridge setup. Now, as we come down into the south, down here, okay, I want to tell you, I, we'll still see daily convective events. We're not shutting that down. It just looks drier overall because this particular setup is going to focus much more rainfall, it appears, over here along the east coast in the mid-Atlantic. So keep, keep all that in the back of your mind as we play forward with this. But I'd now like to share with you what I'm seeing here as I stretch this out to the end of August with respect to the Gulf of Mexico. It tends to stay open in its moisture transport. So what I don't see at this point is anything that's going to signal the development of a large area of higher pressure that would shut down the Gulf of Mexico. With the heat and everything being farther to the, to the west and, and this bigger ridge sitting out here over the open Atlantic, we, keep, we tend to just keep that flow coming in here. Now, one thing I'd like to point out about this particular setup is that in the near term, and I'm just going to draw over the top of this map, we will be getting higher atmospheric pressure at the surface that at times develops over the Great Lakes, hence that drier corridor that you saw in through this area, which I showed you a few moments ago. Well, really, it doesn't get quite that far into the south. It's kind of right in through there. There we go. There's the drier corridor. What's happening here is around this high pressure cell, remember, air flows clockwise like this, and there's a big ridge over here, and it's also flowing clockwise. So right in between the two right here is where things are meeting, and we can see that continuing to be a, a case in the surface flow. Again, you're looking at a mile above your heads right here, but in the surface flow, I'm seeing that quite a bit. But plenty of moisture being evicted in the upper levels. So carrying this discussion a bit further, we also want to look to see what the total momentum of the atmosphere has been doing. And a key component to this year, especially this summer, has been here and here. I'm specifically pointing out the behavior and the strength and the speed of the jet stream here, both in the North Atlantic and in the North Pacific. You see, in years where we've had hot, dry conditions that have developed east of the Rocky Mountains, we tended to find that the flow, both in the North Atlantic and in the North Pacific, was considerably weaker. What we've had is really no major loss in momentum. Now let me show you what I've been showing you lately, and let's just kind of see it in map form here. Everything that just got shaded in gray is for the same area. So what we notice is when we look at our momentum map here, so this is vertically, uh, excuse me, this is vertical and zonal integral of the momentum. In other words, just how fast is the atmosphere moving? We've not lost the momentum between 30 north and 60 north. We lost it here in the tropics when the MJO stalled out, which we talked about quite a bit. Also in our blocking index, remember that while there has been blocking in other places and also at um, uh, in, in lower latitudes, we, we can see that where that Pacific jet stream goes through, very little blocking. Remember, you'd see these colors showing up quite a bit if there was a lot of blocking inside that gray shading. So I have to have evidence to overturn this continuation of these, well, decent jet stream winds. And at this point, I don't have that. So if I put that into a forecast, well, I can at least show you what the models are suggesting first, and then I'm going to add to this where I think they're biased. 
Now, precipitation first from the, from the European. It wants to for the last week of August and the first week of September. So this will be week three and week four forecasting. It really wants to keep the Gulf open and keep just a lot of active convection. Can you see it? There's a lot of green on that. When you go over to temperatures, the model has been biased way too warm for too long. And I've struggled with that forecast. I will fully admit that I've struggled with that forecast. So what we end up seeing is that in through this area at times, we've had a lot more cooler air that has come through. And it's moved into the eastern Corn Belt like we saw at the beginning of the month of August. Now, the CFSV2, which is our other model that we're going to look at here, um, it's... Model run to model run, it is all over the place. But I'll say this about it. When you look overall at its precipitation field, it too doesn't put down a large area of major drought development. In the terms of temperatures, it keeps bringing in heat and then backing off on it again. I just don't think it has the timing perfectly right. I just think what's going on here is like, oh, it builds in a bunch of heat, and then notice the week later, it, it gets rid of it. It builds in a bunch of heat west under a big ridge, but then brings in a trough like this coming through the Pacific Northwest. I think that is the true nature of our unblocked pattern at this particular point. So we start to add to this a few other things. Going to September, just want to share this with you again. We've noticed that over the last seven years, September is a month that has shown a warmer trend, especially in the last decade or so. Look at this. When you put the last decade together as one composite map, we can see that we've, we've really had a much warmer than average all of North America over the last decade for the month of September. So keep, keep that in mind. This is, this is um, September 2010 uh, here through uh, 2019 is what's included in these data. And so when we think about what this September is going to hold, we'd still have to come back and say, well, what are our big players? Because we know we have this La Nina that's trying to get going, but we still have this very warm water in the North Pacific. So our La Nina, can we really call it that? Well, according to the Southern Oscillation Index, even though we've moved positive, you can see here over the last 30 days, which is toward La Nina-like behavior in the ocean pressure and wind patterns, it's not way up here above plus seven, which is where we need to be to consider this a true La Nina. But we've been replacing the warmer surface waters with some cooler water as of late. And right now, our ocean temperatures are back down to negative 0.5, which is in La Nina territory. Remember, when we think about where this is going over September, October, we, we see the models continuing to put that in place, but also keeping this warmth in the North Pacific, which as you've seen, the jet stream has really gone over the top of it, come down into the Pacific Northwest, but not rebounded into huge ridges in the midsection of the country. Quite the contrary, it's actually come in at times and dove farther to the south before riding back across the North Atlantic like this. So that seems to be the, the, the competing factors in this longer range forecast. So as I look out again, I think it's going to come down to us understanding what two things are doing in the tropics. One would be La Nina, and the second is going to be what the MJO does. Because remember, we spent 60 plus days over in phase one, two. It then shot out at the end of July and beginning of August here. It's since come back around is currently sitting almost in null space, and the MJO wants to go right back over to Africa and then possibly stay over Africa, maybe moving into the Indian Ocean. Why that's critical is that will continue to allow for quite a bit of tropical cyclone activity. So if we look at this, and I'm sorry I'm not showing the West Coast on this particular image, if we do let La Nina dominate things, it is typically a warmer and drier pattern for this section of the country. But the big wild card is, do we get tropical systems that come in or do they stay curled out to open ocean? That all depends on how big that high pressure cell is out here in the open Atlantic Ocean. Should it stay strong, it'll help guide some of these systems off of Africa to stay away from the east coast of the United States. But we're going to watch it carefully as we move into the heart of the hurricane season. Now, one last comment here. To show you what that means if we do get a standing wave over Africa or off of Africa into the Indian Ocean, it's going to put a lot of suppressing upper level motion over the Pacific, but allow for a lot more tropical development off of Africa. But to tell you how unestablished and weak the La Nina is at this point, we see now that over the next 15 days, see the reds that are showing up here that are in the central Pacific? That would actually be a westerly wind burst, stronger westerly winds cutting back over towards South America at times. 
times. The easterly winds here are going in this direction. So again, right in the middle here, we have downward motion at the surface, and that is exactly where this sits. So it seems right now that La Nina is being overwhelmed by what's going on with the MJO. And while it just doesn't seem at this point either of these two events are affecting the North Pacific jet stream, which is why, honestly, I'm disconnecting them in this forecast. So um, I appreciate you, you know, you, you sticking around with me as I kind of struggled, I think, to really understand what this pattern is going to do and try to understand some model biases here. But as we move into, you know, this fall time period, I think it's going to boil down to an understanding of where that MJO is on a daily basis to then predict how the Pacific jet stream is going to act and where we're going to see our, a lot of our tropical activity. Okay. I appreciate your attention once again. Look forward to giving you an update tomorrow morning. Until then, have a good one. Thanks.